Welcome, welcome everybody to the April 201, to the April MAGEX talk. We're delighted that Steve Hill is going to give the talk. And we're also delighted that Terry DeBurka is going to be the discussion leader and take it, Terry. Thank you, Laura. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stephen Hill, uh, who started his uh, career, his academic career, I guess, with a PhD that he received from the University of Oxford, uh, followed by a professorship at Montana State University before moving to University of Florida. And oh, I just realized I forgot he was a postdoc at the Maglev uh, after his PhD before uh, University of uh, State University in Montana. And then University of Florida, and finally back at Florida State University as a professor of physics and a director of the EMR uh, facility. Uh, we'll deal with a Q&A after uh, Steve's talk. You're welcome to post question in the, in the chat uh, during the, the talk. Uh, Steve, the floor is yours. Okay, let me check that you will see this. Is that good? Yes, it looks perfect. All right, thanks. Thanks, Thierry, and thanks, Laura. So I'm going to kind of give you a 30,000 foot overview um, of what EMR is and why we do it at the MagLab uh, in this presentation. And I guess the first obvious question is, um, what is EMR and why at the MagLab? And so more than half of the talk will be on this topic. Um, so we use the acronym EMR at the MagLab, Electron Magnetic Resonance, and somehow an analogy with uh, NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. Um, there are other names you'll find in the literature. Perhaps the most common are EPR, Electron Paramagnetic Resonance, and Electron Spin Resonance, ESR. But there are many other things as well, like Ferromagnetic Resonance, Cyclotron Resonance, et cetera, et cetera. And so we kind of, uh, it's a decision that was made a long time ago to, to use this all-encompassing term EMR. And like NMR, EMR is a local probe of electrons in their environment in atoms, ions, molecules, and solids. Now, one problem, and it's also a problem for nuclei, of course, is there's a tendency for electrons to pair in molecules and solids. So I've just a couple of examples here showing you what happens if, for example, if you have two orbitals forming a bond, you get symmetric and asymmetric combinations, and the two electrons associated with those orbitals will typically uh, doubly occupy the, the, the bonding orbitals with spins anti-aligned, and therefore the system doesn't have any unpaired spins. And in order to have an EPR active or EMR active system, we need unpaired electrons. And of course, there are many situations where this does occur, again, just as, as the case is with nuclei. And the most obvious situation is where you have uh, say a molecule that's comprised of two 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 atoms that have um, odd and even electron counts. So uh, just the example I uh, given here, nitrous oxide, you have four p electrons for oxygen, but just three for nitrogen. Um, and so when you put those into the bonding and antibonding p orbitals, you fully occupy the bonding orbitals, and you have just one electron left over in the antibonding state, and that gives rise to an, a spin s equal half state for that molecule. And we call this a, a, a radical. Um, and there are many examples of organic radicals in, in, in nature, and they play a huge role in EPR. Um, I show here an example of a nitroxide radical, and these are often used, um, for example, to tag um, uh, systems that might otherwise be EPR silent. Say, for example, a large biological molecule, you can do some biochemistry to attach this spin label, and then all of a sudden it becomes EPR active, and you can uh, follow that spin to study structure and dynamical changes of the molecule of interest. And of course, there are tons of other uh, situations as well. I just have a couple here. You can imagine an electron transfer reaction where you had electrons that were paired, but you uh, remove an electron from a molecule and now it becomes charged, but you leave behind an unpaired spin. Um, and so that allows you then to study chemical reactivity. You could trap, for example, the molecule in this state here, um, and, uh, and, and it would be EPR active, and you could study that and follow chemical reactions. Or you could shine light on a on a paramagnet uh, on a non-magnetic compound and generate spin pairs, and they could either form triplets where the spins are aligned or singlets. Um, and of course, this kind of chemistry and physics is relevant to uh, photosynthesis and, and the idea of uh, light harvesting, uh, generating uh, uh, energy from light. But it's also a huge area of, of interest currently in quantum spin science and also even quantum biology. Um, for example, if you generate a pair in this fashion those two electrons are necessarily entangled. So if you had some large 
uh, conjugated molecule, you could imagine delocalizing the two spins, uh, but those spins would still be entangled. And so you can think about ideas like quantum teleportation and so on. And it, there's also a lot of ideas in biology how this quantum phenomena associated with uh, um, photo-generated pairs can play roles in, for example, uh, avian navigation uh, and so on. And then, of course, the, the one that's probably closest to, to what we do in the EMR group uh, in Tallahassee, or a large number of our users, is you just look over the, 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 the vast parts of the periodic table, particularly in the middle, for example, transition metals and lanthanides, the DNF block, where you have uh, many, many ionic compounds and even covalent situations where uh, these transition met metals or lanthanides uh, can take on various different oxidation states. And thanks to something called Hund's rules, which I won't go into the details here, uh, but th these uh, ions tend to favor very large spin states. Um, so uh, for example, uh, here are some examples of transition metal and, uh, metals and, 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 and lanthanides. And uh, just a few of the examples here, for example, if you look at manganese three, uh, if you start off with manganese, its uh, atomic configuration would have two S electrons and three 5D, uh, uh, so th sorry, five 3D electrons and two 4S electrons. And if you go into the two plus state, you typically strip out the S electrons and you're left with five unpaired D electrons that can then, because of Hund's rule, they all align up and give you a very large spin state of five halves. Um, if you go just remove one of those electrons, you get a spin two state and so on. And with gadolinium, since you have seven f orbitals, you can end up with the largest spin state of, of, of spin seven halves. So these are incredibly magnetic uh, uh, ions. Um, they play a crucial role in things like magnetism, um, uh, but also in, in chemical processes like catalysis, where um, the ability to switch oxidation state can, can mediate chemical reactions. And so many of our users come to the magnet lab to study these systems. So I've kind of got a, a laundry list here of uh, the various um, kind of systems that we can study using EMR. I'm not going to read out the whole list, but you can see it encompasses a lot of magnetic materials. It can even encompass things like superconductors, even though the electrons may be paired, if that pairing energy is small, you might be able to generate excitations with, with the uh, EPR experiment um, to, um, at those kind of energies. Uh, in addition, studies of semiconductors all the way through to biological systems. And so this is a highly interdisciplinary field impacting physics, material science, chemistry, and, and, and all of, you know, a lot of biochemistry and, and, and biology and biophysics. So taking a step back and looking at, um, you know, what is EMR? Um, so, you know, the basic picture here is if you put a spin in a magnetic field, it experiences a torque. Um, it's given by the cross product of the magnetic moment of the electron with the magnetic field. And the physics is exactly the same as the spinning top in an Earth's gravitational field. So that spin will process at a given frequency. And ultimately that frequency is linear in magnetic field. And it just depends on the ratio of the charge on the electron and the mass of the electron. Of course, it could also be the mass of a proton if you're dealing with NMR. Um, and for free electrons, this G factor here uh, it's fundamental, essentially fundamental constant is very, very close to two. And so you're left with a situation where the ratio of the frequency of the Larmor precession and the magnetic field uh, comes out to be 28 gigahertz per Tesla. So if you put one Tesla on a, on a, on a, on a, a spin on a free electron, it will process at that frequency. And if you then shine resonant um, um, microwave radiation on the material, um, the, the interaction between the microwaves and the resonant microwaves can flip that spin. And that's what we mean by uh, um, um, EMR, electron magnet, magnetic resonance. And for comparison, uh, here's an image of, a, of, a, of an uh, MRI of somebody's brain, uh, where in this case, you're looking at protons. The gyromagnetic ratio, the gamma factor is, is, is 42.5 megahertz per Tesla. So there's essentially three orders of magnitude difference between the EPR frequency and the NMR frequency for free electrons. Um, now that leads to some problems, not least the fact that you can't really do this nice uh, MRI imaging with microwaves, because as we all know, if you put your brain in the microwave, it's not a particularly good idea. Um, so uh, we are limited in, in terms of imaging capability. Um, but of course, there are lots of cases where you want to study what electrons are doing and not what, what, what protons are doing. And so uh, you know, the main application of EMR is to study the role of electrons in chemical and physical processes. Um, 
simple quantum mechanical picture here, the idea of, of, of two, if you've just got a simple free electron spin half, it has two possible projections, spin up and spin down. And again, this physics, the splitting between those levels is, is ultimately related to that, um, that gyro magnet, that, that Larmor precession frequency. And so the splitting between these two levels splits linearly with magnetic field as you increase the magnetic field strength. So if I shine a quantum of, of microwave radiation onto my sample, at the point in magnetic field where that quantum of, of, of microwave energy matches the energy spacing of the two levels, I see an absorption. Uh, and that's my resonance. And from that, I can, um, in principle, measure this g-factor. Uh, technical detail here, sometimes we measure these spectra in, in, in derivative mode using field modulation. But that's not a particularly important detail here. So at the mag lab, if I plot that 28 gigahertz per Tesla line on this two-dimensional plot of uh, frequency versus magnetic field, you can see here this red dashed line. So that tells me right away that I need frequencies in the range up to sort of you know, from a few gigahertz up to terahertz or even above a terahertz if I'm going to probe free electrons. But of course, electrons in molecules and solids are not free. Um, I've already told you earlier in the in the presentation that you know they, they reside in atomic orbitals and they're involved in chemical bonding. And so they therefore interact with each other and their environment. In particular, they interact. Um, so the electronic spin will interact with the orbit the orbital uh, angular momentum associated with the orbital that the electron lives in. Uh, but there are also spin-spin uh, interactions. So for example, two spins in the same molecule, uh, they can act either through dipolar interactions, they're just magnets. And so like any two magnets would interact with each other. Same is true for two spins. But there's also quantum mechanical interactions associated with exchange uh, that can give rise to stronger spin-spin interactions. And likewise, you can have an interaction between the electron spin and the nuclear spin through uh, electron nuclear hyperfine interactions. And again, those can be of dipolar origin or quantum mechanical uh, direct contact interaction between the electrons and the nucleus. Um, now, the one that I just wanted to focus on in a moment, because it's really the crux of the, the rest of the talk, is this spin orbit interaction. Um, so these spins that we study by electron spin resonance or electron magnetic resonance, if um, that wasn't for the spin orbit interaction, the spin itself would sort of, in some sense, be completely ob oblivious to the orbital that it lives in. Um, so in a so typical solid, you have all kinds of electric fields and so on, and the spin wouldn't, really wouldn't know about those. They wouldn't have a great deal of knowledge about chemical bonding. But the electron spin knows about the orbital states because of this spin orbit interaction. So you can imagine a spin in this very sort of uh, cartoonish behavior sort of um, picture uh, almost elementary school uh, level where you've got an electron uh, orbiting around the nucleus of an atom. Uh, to the electron, it really looks like the nucleus is orbiting around the electron, just like we perceive the sun to be rotating about the Earth. And as we know from our uh, elementary e m classes, if you have a positive charge that's undergoing an orbit, it generates a magnetic field at the center of that orbit. And that magnetic field, of course, can then couple to that electron. So therefore, sort of by definition, the spin knows about the orbital that it lives in. And if it weren't for that interaction, uh, you wouldn't be able to have access to half the information that I'm going to tell you about in the remainder of the talk. Um, so it's that spin orbit interaction that allows you to know about the orbital state. And from that, you can learn about the, um, uh, you know, once the electron knows what, or what orbital it lives in, it can start to understand how that orbital interacts with adjacent orbitals through chemical bonding and so on and so forth. Um, now, the crux of this, though, is when you have spin orbit coupling, and it tends to get stronger as you go down the periodic table, it drives your excitations far away from this G equals 2 line. Um, so I'm just indicated by these arrows here. So as soon as you include the spin orbit interaction, you no longer expect your EPR spectrum to be precisely on this line. It shifts away. And it shifts further away depending on how strong that spin orbit interaction is. And the shifts can be really huge. You know, in NMR, you often talk about shifts of parts per million. Um, in EPR, those shifts can be the whole way, if you like. In other words, if you do a measurement at 800 gigahertz, you could have a resonance at zero magnetic field in principle. Um, if you do a measurement down here at, uh, at uh, just five, uh, sorry, at, at just 100 gigahertz, you might see a resonance all the way up here at 45 Tesla. So the, the shifts are far bigger than the, often than the expected frequency for a free electron. And so that requires us to be able to do measurements over this entire landscape, uh, not just uh, all fields up to the highest available in Tallahassee, but to very high frequencies as well. Um, 
And so then it becomes a, a you know big part of EPR is combining with theory. Uh, because intimately the magnetism and the EMR spectrum are, are, are very intimately connected to the underlying structure. So if you measure the EPR spectrum and you don't know the structure, for example, um, uh, you can then apply theory and try to predict what the spectrum should look like based on some um, guest structure and sort of iterate um, and, and, and allow uh, eventually hone in on the structure. Conversely, if you know the structure, uh, you ought to be able to predict the magnetism and EPR uh, spectrum, and then you could, of course, verify that by EPR. And so this connection between structure and, and magnetism and EMR, uh, that is of fundamental importance all the way from physics to chemistry uh, uh, to biology. So again, this is a highly interdisciplinary uh, area of research. So there are two kinds of magnetic interaction that involve the spin-orbit interaction. And we're getting a little bit technical here because I have a spin Hamiltonian. Uh, but essentially, there are there are just two terms, and the first one just looks like the Zeeman interaction. In other words, it's an interaction that depends on the magnetic field strength and on the value of the spin. Uh, but instead of a G factor, which was previously two point zero zero two three, just a number for a free electron, uh, this um, product between the field and the spin now depends on the details of the spin orbit interaction. Uh, I'm not going to go into details here, but that's essentially what's contained in this term here. So that's a field dependent interaction. And you can also have a zero field splitting interaction. In other words, a term that doesn't depend on the spin. It's quadratic in the spin operators. It depends on the spin orbit coupling strength. And again, it depends on the details of the spin orbit coupling. And we can just lump these into two tensors, a G tensor, which uh, uh, parameterizes the Zeeman effect and a D tensor, which par parameterizes this uh, zero field splitting. And just a technicality, this term is really only important once you go beyond spin one half. As it turns out, the nature of this tensor is such that it can never split uh, the, the, the spin up and spin down plus or minus half states of a spin half in zero magnetic field. And so just showing here is an example of a cartoon of the Zeeman levels for um, uh, uh, two different G factors. And it could be a compound now. So, so this tensor now is essentially anisotropic. So the value of G depends on the orientation you play in a magnetic field. And so for two different orientations, you have a different Zeeman splitting with respect to field. And so your resonance would occur at two different positions. And I think you'll notice that the splitting between these two resonances at high field would be much more than the corresponding splitting, splitting at low magnetic fields. So there's a, just like in NMR, there's a huge advantage uh, if you're wanting to resolve uh, G anisotropy uh, by going to high magnetic fields because you have much better resolution. And just really quickly here uh, is an example of a, so of a solution or a powder spectrum where you, you, you don't have, you're not looking at crystal, but you have all orientations of, of the sample under study within your uh, sample. Um, and so you can imagine an absorption that you have an onset of absorption when you hit the large G value, uh, and then you get the, the, the absorption switches off when you get to the, to the smaller G value for the different molecules or, or, or crystals in your, in your, in your uh, uh, um, powder or solution. So if you take a derivative of this, you'll get uh, peaks and dips at the extremes of the spectrum. And that, that allows you to immediately infer uh, things like GX and GY, uh, the, the Z and X, sorry, GX and GZ, the G and X components of your G tensor. But it turns out you also get an inflection at the Y component as well. And this is just a simulation, it's low field, it's just for illustrative purposes. But if you do this at low field, low frequency, um, it's quite hard to resolve this splitting here. But if you go to a higher magnetic field, it's exactly the same total field range along the bottom here. Uh, so the two figures uh, can be compared directly. You've got much better resolution uh, between GX and GY by going to higher frequencies and higher magnetic field. And if we take this to the limit, 700 gigahertz, 25 Tesla, you can observe in this real experiment uh, carried out some years ago now, but it's just an example of a organic tryptophan radical that um, can undergo two different conformations as it binds to an azurin protein. And in those two different cases, you have a slightly different G tensor. Um, and the difference in the main principal component is just 75 parts per million, and even less in these uh, uh, um, um, in, the, in the smaller G components. But this is the one that um, could be predicted and was modeled in this particular study here. And you can identify the absence or, or, or presence or absence of a hydrogen bond in this case. And there'd just be no way on earth you would be able to resolve that difference at commercial frequencies where commercial spectrometers are available down here at low fields and low frequencies. Real quick on the um, 
the zero field splitting interaction. So here, I told you it, it makes no difference for spin one half, but for a spin one, where you now have three levels that have projections minus one, zero, and plus one, with if this D tensor was just zero, um, you're allowed two transitions. The EPR selection rule is uh, you change the spin projection by one, so you can go from minus one to zero, or you can go from zero to plus one. Those two resonances would be exactly on top of each other, so you'd not be able to know that there were two resonances there. But when you have zero fill splitting, in other words, a finite value component of this D tensor, so I've just modeled the case where we've only got a Z component of that tensor, what you do is you lift the degeneracy between the plus and minus one levels and the zero level, and now those two transitions occur at different magnetic fields. And so you'd see a splitting in your spectrum, and from that splitting, you'd be able to evaluate this uh, D parameter. Um, now, of course, that's a huge uh, structural diagnostic value. So if you wanted to learn something about the structure of the material, measuring that splitting um, is extremely valuable. And by looking at all orientations of the magnetic field, you can get the other components of this tensor as well. Um, but technologically, this is an important parameter as well, because ultimately, this axial component of this D tensor dictates the magnetic anisotropy of the compound. And if you're interested in making hard magnetic materials, you want a very strong magnetic anisotropy. So you want this D to be as big as possible. So that would move those peaks as far apart as possible. And that then requires you measuring over much wider ranges of field and frequency in order to uh, measure these things. Um, so you really, you know, pushing the envelope on measuring D requires uh, pushing the envelope on magnetic field and frequency as well. And here's just an example of a spin one system uh, a molecular compound um, where it's actually a single crystal study, but it turns out there are two orientations of the molecule in the in the crystal. And, and so you see the spectra of both superimposed. Um, but in this case, the magnetic field was nicely aligned with one of the species. So you see a beautiful layman, linear Zeeman effect for one of the species with a fixed offset, uh, both on the plus and negative frequency axis. And just from that intercept, you can measure this uh, Z, uh, Z component of the D tensor. But for the other species, because it's tilted, there's a tension between the Zeeman interaction and the zero field splitting interaction, and you get a nonlinear Zeeman effect. But when you fit these, you can work out what the orientation of that tilted molecule is, because essentially it's, it's structurally identical. And these things have uh, affectionately been known in the community. It's not a name we made up as a, as a Florida map, where you measure uh, these transitions over a wide range of fields and frequencies. It really allows you to pin down these spin Hamiltonian parameters. Okay, and the time that I have left, and I started my stopwatch a few minutes late, so I know I'm, I'm wary of the fact I'm getting towards the end. I just want to uh, end talking a little bit about some of the technical difficulties of these. You know, thanks to being at the Mag Lab, we have access to these very high magnetic fields, but this range of going up to a terahertz gives us a kind of double whammy uh, because it's well known that, you know, there's a real problem producing microwaves in this frequency range. From the low frequency range, you start with electronic oscillators, essentially, but it becomes harder and harder to, to, to generate microwaves via an oscillator as you go towards one terahertz. On the other side, you've got sort of lasers, uh, um, uh, these, these are conventional semiconductor lasers and quantum cascade lasers, but they work less and less well as you go towards the terahertz. So uh, a big part of the work in our group is sort of trying to overcome these limitations and build instrumentation that provides the stability, sensitivity, resolution, and power in order to be able to do these uh, fancy uh, EPR and EMR uh, uh, measurements. Um, and so I just really want to point out the way we typically do this. We, we, come, we, we favor coming from the solid state side. So we start with low frequency oscillators. Um, and then we use a chains of multipliers to multiply. So for example, you might start with an oscillator at eight gigahertz and just multiply it um, to get up to, in principle, you can get all the way up to a terahertz using these ideas using amplifiers in between at various frequencies in between. And we also have a series of vacuum devices, uh, oscillators again, they're not really lasers, that work up to about a terahertz. And from the high end, we collaborate with uh, Mike Ozerov in the DC field facility and uses uh, FTIR, Fourier Transfer Infrared instrumentation to get the much higher frequencies. And all of this capability in principle is compatible with the DC facility all the way up to uh, 45 tesla if necessary. And then on the pulse side, we really, uh, build dedicated spectrometers that work around these frequencies that you see written here. Again, we use solid state synthesizers and multiplier chains and fast pin switches allow us to study dynamics. So look at out of equilibrium spin 
uh, physics. And I don't uh, unfortunately have time to go into great detail here, but these are really truly unique instruments that nothing else anywhere in the world uh, is comparable. You can see where these pulsed instruments stack up uh, on this graph here. And most of the commercial instruments are down here. Mm -hmm. This is a particularly widespread instrument that, that, that was made by Brooker a few years ago uh, up here. Um, and these pulse measurements to describe pulse DPR would be a MAGX talk essentially in itself. Um, and I don't, uh, I, I, it wasn't my plan to discuss it today, but they allow us to measure many of these other interactions that I mentioned, like the electron nuclear hyperfine interactions. And again, we have, uh, you know, unique capabilities that will be developed at the lab along those lines. And so just to end here, our tour de force instrument, Hyper, if anybody wants to learn, you know, wants me to tell them more about this instrument, please uh, contact me privately and we can talk about it. Or maybe I can give a MAGX talk again in the future. Okay. Um, but this is really state of the art. And so I will end there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. Um, and uh, I guess now it's time for, for questions. And if some of you want to raise your hand or open uh, unmute and ask questions. Should I stop the share or should I keep it up? Uh, uh, Lewis has got a, a question. Do you want to? Ask Lewis. Yeah, Lewis, uh, go ahead. You're the first one with your hand up. Okay. You can stop the share. It might be better. We can see your face. Okay. That's fine. So, Steve, I have a couple of questions, right? Uh, you said that we can measure superconductors, which, which usually are metallic before they go in superconducting state. Yeah. So, microwaves are usually uh, reflected strongly by metals. Um, yeah. How easy is it to do, actually? EPR it's on a not survival. easy, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. The problem is the better the conductivity is, the harder it becomes, because mm -hmm. essentially you're probing a thinner and thinner layer of electrons, but it can be done. Um, and, but do you see a, what, what kind of information? Do you see a Hubble peak like you see in NMR? What, what kind of information can you get? From well, um, you, you, the Hubble-Schlichter peak, you have to be able to do... Um, Dynamics, so you you obviously be studying um, you know spin echo type measurements. And I really doubt with current technology that that's possible in a metal because the relaxation times of the electrons are going to be so fast. So you'd really just be measuring a G factor, so or G tensor. Mm -hmm. So you'd be learning something about the spin orbit coupling in the material. Um, so you're you're not going to be able to apply the kind of the NMR methodology in a metal uh, that you can in in a, in a, in a with, uh, with with NMR. So then, then comes my second question, uh, my last question. So that to give space for the others. So we have been measuring topological semi-metals, right? And yeah. uh, many of them, for reasons that I don't understand, when we use quantum oscillations, look for the so-called spin zeros. We get gigantic G factors in there, multiple spin zeros in the KDM G factors are really an isotropic. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure what this all means. Um, would be something, would you expect the G factors we extract from quantum oscillations to be distinct from the G factors we extract from, from EPR? So I mean, it's, that's a tough, tough question. It takes me back to my graduate studies where we weren't looking at ESR, but we were looking at, um, at psychotron resonance. Um, so it's, it's a form of electromagnetic resonance. But, you know, you're probing, you're not necessarily probing the same quantities when you measure. Um, when you extract parameters from analysis of quantum oscillations that you get from a from a, a resonant excitation excitation that's why i asked my question so, yes. yeah so i mean you're looking kind of well when i think about psychotron resonance you measure a mass and it's related to a density of states right at the fermi energy right um, whereas the psychotron resonance is an excitation away from the fermi energy and those two masses don't necessarily need to agree mm -hmm. i don't know if i've got an answer for you for the spin resonance, but I'd imagine you might run into some similar phenomena, similar phenomena. But if you've got strong spin orbit coupling, then probably you would measure interesting G factors. Okay, thank you. So, Lewis, this is Ross. I think there's some work I'm remembering, and I think it's on ethereum rhodium two silicon two, where they can measure um, big anisotropy. It's very Ising-like anisotropy of um, ESR. Um, and it's something like G factors three and a half in one direction, almost nothing in the other in the metallic state. And I think there's some measurements there where they correlated it with what they think the G factor is from some fermiology type measurements at higher fields. 
I, yeah, I that kind of it. might be worth looking up. I'm trying that to kind of well. isotropy, by the way, is not unusual um, because when you have a when you have a transition metal, very often, you know, depending on how many unpaired electrons it's, it has, you might have a series of doublets, and very often in the ESR spectrum, you're only really looking at the lowest doublet. And so what you measure, in fact, is not a real G value, but it's an effective G factor. Um, so it doesn't characterize the entire electronic state. And those effective G factors are somehow renormalized and they can be very anisotropic. Um, yeah, being the issues that we measure things at the order of 10, sometimes 20, I'm scratching my head. How is this all possible? So I'm wondering if it's, what are we... Well, I mean, if you've, got a, if you've got a doublet and you're dealing with a lanthanide, we measure G factors of 20, close to 20, yeah, no, this is a transition metal compounds. Well, but but still, we... still, you could probably, if you've got a strong orbital contribution, 10 doesn't surprise me. 20 starts to get a little bit shaky, but 10, uh, you know, eight is not out of the realms of possibility for just a simple transition cobalt, for example. Um, okay, probably should discuss it. Perhaps we should try combining some APR and, and some of this. Yeah. And semi metals so, might be a little easier because they're semi metals, not because they're. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly. That's the point. And if they're anis if the conductivity is anisotropic, that can be helpful as well because sometimes you can polarize the microwaves in a way that that they don't excite currents, and 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 so you can get better penetration that way. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know if we could take. Uh, we have time for one or more question. Yes. Uh, the the, 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 the team. Yeah, the D matrix, uh, the one that splits the levels and the triplet in zero field. How should I think about that physically? What gives rise to that? Oh, so it, it's uh, essentially it's a stark effect on the on the atomic orbitals. So imagine that you you have a set of D orbitals and you have some nearby charges, either due to ionic bonding or some co co covalent interaction that lifts the degeneracy of the d orbitals then you then you impose the spin orbit interaction and so the different components of the the orbital the, the angular momentum operator will connect different orbital states and depending on the relative order of the levels uh, you know that 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 matrix is it just has all of the matrix elements of l dot s between all of the orbital states within a certain active space. I mean, in principle, you could do it for all orbital states, but you, because it's a perturbative calculation, you typically combine it to just one set of orbitals. Um, mm -hmm. so, so ultimately you're seeing the Stark effect on the atomic or on the, on the orbital states. Okay. Itself on the spin states through the spin orbit interaction. Thanks. And it's not entirely intuitive because it's, there's two interactions. It's not just one. I think your uh, suggestion to give another MAGEX talk on the instrumentation would be great, but we won't make you do it next month. Um, before I let Terry close out, I want to remind people the next MAGEX talk is May 23rd. Uh, we'll take volunteers. Otherwise, I'll go after you. Terry, do you want to close out? Just thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Steve, for uh, a very good awesome uh, introduction to EMR. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Sorry awesome. for really, really good.